avant, avant de lui donner la parole. But before giving thought to how we'd like to emphasize that she also founded in 1985 the Laboratory Museum of Contemporary Art. And in her quality of uh, director, she has been for several years now following up on those arts laboratories of uh, the Sant'Egidio community, in which physical or mental handic mentally handicapped people are accompanied to um, achieve certain results in their relational artistic quest. Thank you for that. Dopo la nostalgia del significato degli oggetti consumati e buttati dagli uomini contemporanei, passiamo alla nostalgia dell'invisibile, che era propria degli artisti, proprio del futurismo. Okay, so after this uh, brief detour via the uh, cabinet of curiosity is basically lost and found objects, I I'm going to try and focus on the incompatibility, intrinsic compatibility between art and uh, uh, and war, because um, this is inherent to the construction power of imagination and uh, its natural repulsion for violence, in my opinion. The artists of the avant-garde already in the first years of the First World War um, tried to escape the war by becoming, turning into some sort of nomads in Europe. And they tried to gather their strength, obviously, by testifying of um, attesting of their transformation power through this energy of imagination, um, struggling for peace and international relationships. And in fact, we um, owe to Charles Baudelaire at the end of the 19th century already the assertion according to which um, poetry and politics were to be absolutely incompatible. And also going a little further back, of course, to the ousting of uh, the Republica in, Plato, in Plato's uh, uh, Republic, the ousting of uh, the Republic of the artists out of this Republic. So. Obviously, we have an image of Europe which, in many respects, resembles a little bit the situation that we are now experiencing in um, the th a century later, in 2014, given the enormous social transformations that we are experiencing in Europe and um, that were going on already in the first two decades of the, the 20th century. And this especially, I suppose, through or by means of the development of uh, Einstein's scientific um, uh, theories and also Freud's discovery of uh, the uh, revelation of the uh, interior obsessions, basically, of the subconscious, which matched uh, the obsessions of society at the time. So, um, the artists tried as best as they could to behave as nomads in this global society that was uh, uh, that was trans pierced basically by all sorts of violences and and uh, and waves of um, violence of all kinds and they tried as much as possible to unite and to develop their new forms of language and scientific drawing from scientific theory as well and without meaning to make too many analogies with the uh, revology, uh, the technological revolution of the internet and the broadcasting power, a uh, certain anxiety um, was certainly channeled uh, through uh, the creative artists at the time. But I have to add that today's type of nomadism in many respects also differs from the artists of the time which were essentially bourgeois. Whereas here, I'd say in contemporary times, most artists um, remain, of course, nomads in, um, at heart, in their souls and in their behaviors, but often, often emanate from the people or can be migrants or can be people less privileged from an economic or social point of view because uh, the people who've had to uh, migrate um, for 
all sorts of reasons tend to anticipate and preempt the sufferings today a little bit more than was the case at the beginning of the 20th century. But all of this goes to say that science and art in a way remains uh, intrinsically uh, collected and participates to the level of diversity to a greater and balanced uh, degree of diversity we should wish for our society. So the 20th century, for example, has witnessed the development of uh, futurism and cubism, as you know, and um, all of this was a means of um, um, coming across the sufferings of the war, of the First World War. And a certain uh, example that I wanted to talk to you about has to do with Umberto Boccioni, who, before dying in the year 1916, um, through this desperate message against war, trying to draw um, from his relationship and his correspondence with the famous international pianist and composer, Ferruccio Pussoni. So it is worth wondering whether this revolution of the futurist language that was developed throughout those uh, uh, perilous years of the war would have developed in such a beautiful way had the story of um, well, the culture of um, the world were not provided them with this sort of context, of course. But it is a way just like painters referred to um, pre-revolutionary means of expression and as Paul Cezanne did in order to um, reflect a different image of humankind. It's not only a question of aesthetics, it's also a question of interior mutation. And it's also a reflection of huge interior crisis, basically, that made possible um, international encounters between musicians as well as painters and all sorts of artists. And um, so was Ferruccio Busoni, who was an international musician. who used to write letters and um, regular correspondence to his wife, to his friends uh, from all over the world. And he would tell stories by means of those letters about the crisis or the violences that he would be a witness of. And he would reflect probably slightly more deeply than the way we tend to by means of a more expeditive uh, emails and those uh, correspondence extras on what the role of humankind and artists um, might be basically in the face of so many devastating um, destructions. And today we know that soldiers don't die as much as they used to in the first two world wars. It's more civilians usually that are um, directly concerned by a war. And in a way, that is a consequence perhaps of what was already outlined at the time by Bocconi, who said um, that he was frightened in one of the interesting letters anyway that uh, I was able to quote an extract of because I know I was um, asked to be a little briefer, perhaps in synthetic then, I would like to be, but then Buccioni was supposed to commission a portrait for Busoni, and um, in one of their correspondence he said that basically he, the way humankind and turned out to be too natural and too tolerant, basically, of everything that was subjected to him, whether grand or whether monstrous or whether strange, when he was talking about the war. And unfortunately, Bocconi died. Uh, 
immediately after um, finishing the portrait of uh, Busoni uh, of a cannonball in 1916. And what I wanted to remember, basically, relating to the futurist cause, basically, was a few of the things that they reflected upon in their letters. And Pocioni, after learning about the death of Pozzoni, still greatly afflicted by this news, wrote about the war that precisely this um, excessive tolerance or acceptance on behalf of the world, basically, of the horrible things as much as the grand ones, was a sign of humankind losing their minds, literally. Because more than the actions that actually trigger a war. What surprises me is the stupid obedience or submissiveness with which people accept decidedly uh, certain things which in normal times should um, not be taken for granted and which suddenly can uh, be accepted um, as being part of the noble um, profession of warfare, basically. And that, unfortunately, regrettably justifies the general uh, recruitment and drafting already um, of people, the young men who um, accept to enroll in the army. And so the international mobilization today is a vast system, basically, to instrument, instrumentalize the weakness of individual consciousness, basically. And it is obviously a remarkably efficient tool to consolidate one's power on the individual. So through the observation of those violent images of violence, Okay, in 1914, we didn't have as many media around, perhaps, but even though it wasn't as intense in terms of images or whatever, it was still quite present and, in a way, was sufficient anyway to point out the complicity of some members of the civil society and, in fact, the most shocking thing that happened in the year 1914 was precisely the systematic submission of the individual to a uh, so-called fate, a uh, so-called fate and uh, a degree of resignation that was really scary in the eyes of the artist, as he describes it well in this correspondence. So, uh, especially for those artists who extol the beauties of art for um, Revealing the invisible and certain um, less obvious aspects of reality with a lot of intuition, um, they remained in shock as images of uh, the actual horror and reality slowed in gradually, and so they eventually ended up describing Alessia Cezanne. And Bocioni was um, writing to his friend shortly before dying himself. I am a guest of this town, was writing Bocioni de Pratella from the Villa di Busoni in San Remigio in uh, June 1916. I write a lot in all, in all meanings of the world. I was writing to Marinetti how horrible and terrible it is to to recapitulate a whole century of painting when you see that the newcomers uh, joining us in this futuristic group are actually s supporting the ideas and um, taking some of our concepts for their own uh, while completely mutilating their very nature or their initial intentions.
And Fedor Chibusoni also added to Bocciari and Jurek. I'm really happy to uh, read about uh, about your uh, decision not to answer the draft uh, convocation. Um, your letter actually happily surprised me, and I so much understand your decision because such an interruption of your beautiful work. Uh, it would be intolerable. But a few days before the death of Boccioni, he was also writing to a musician, um, a gallery, sorry, in Berlin, whose name was Weldon, saying that he would exit this life with a total despite for anything that is anything but art. But on the other hand, nothing is more terrible than art. Because anything I see or I come across these days is nothing more than a kind of blind paintbrush, a sort of harmonious verse, or a, a vaguely well-composed musical tone that basically amounts to a purely mechanical and systematic sort of um, technique. whereas only art should exist. And basically, all the artists who ended up in Paris creating cubism and uh, all sorts of other major currents were trying to set up artists' collectives and corporations in uh, the Ruche of Montparnasse, for example. Um, among others, of course, of Vladimir Baranofrosin, Sonia Delaunay, who came from Russia, and she had to flee from the communist and Joseph Fanchak, Yosef Zatkin, Kessling, Chagall, Max Teichstein, Fernand Léger, Jacques Lipchix, Blaise Sandra, the poet, Max Jacob, James Soutin, Robert Delaunay, Amelio Modigliani, Constantin Brancusi from Romania, Diego Rivera from Latin America, and of course, Guillaume Apollinaire, who was born in Rome, as you might know, but whose mother migrated to Paris when he was still very young. So there was also the years of, uh, the first years, in fact, of the the cinema industry, and all of these artists tried to fight for their diversity by creating and setting up all those artistic collectives, and trying to integrate the new discoveries of science while trying to um, remember the previous cultural uh, revolutions. So, to art was the only way to express some sort of uh, resistance to war and to violence of war. And the artists continued to assert those specific positions fairly consistently, um, doing or interfering with politics only to reiterate their position that was uh, antagonistic to the logic of war, to colonialism, to the rule of man on man, to the, the radicalization of or the ex extreme exploitation of religions, and all those poetic and artistic positions, cubism of Dadaism or of surrealism and so on, converged towards these common sense conclusions. So I would say that art was branded just as a resistance movement throughout those two world wars, but unfortunately, as most of them had to um, realize, this art is only a means or a movement of resistance accessible to a small number of initiated people. Only perhaps 300 people, not to the mass of citizens and of workers. And for them, scandal is usually a more efficient way of communication. That was why certain poets 
of which I would like to quote only one extract from Les Sambra. Two more minutes, if you will allow me. Uh-huh. I know I was supposed to cut cut my speech down to half a page only, but um, I get I tend to get carried away when I'm uh, thinking of all those poets and artists, especially from the period period of uh, Cubism and Bocconi's uh, contemporaries. Place on how the um, huge. Uh, monument of the French culture who traveled all the way to Russia and anticipated the Japanese Revolution before arriving in Paris. He, at one point, at the end of the war, after writing his famous book, The Prose of the Trans-Siberian and the, of the Little John of France, was working on a film script called The End of the World, filmed by the angel. And so that was a movie pitch, basically, with Apolline and Jean Cocteau. And this film was interestingly conceived as a sort of a series of 22 small scripts, making up the novel in itself and illustrated by Fernand Léger, the Cubist artist. And unfortunately, our putting now died before the actual making of the film. So, the first film-esque book with her knowledge as illustration was nevertheless set up. But basically, um, I'd like to quote this extract of um, the first of the 55 small chapters that make up uh, this uh, novel. And it goes as follows. God, our Lord the Father, was sitting at his American desk. He was hastily signing um, innumerable papers. He was sitting in his shirt sleeves next to his green lampshade. And then he rose, lit up his big cigar, consulting his watch. and walked nervously to his office, going and coming nervously while chewing his cigar. So this summarizes quite well all all of the stereotypes of the regions of the world uh, uh, concerning leaders in general, I suppose, uh, going from the American to the Vatican or to the Latin American um, cliches regarding leaders. And all the Leila Mayna Rasputin. So this conclusion was rather amusing and struck the world with this disgrace, basically and the plagues that political power convey throughout the whole world as if focused through the lens of a camera, basically. And the publishing house that was going to publish later on also uh, the Homme Nouveau, the new men of Blaise Sanha straight out of the Second World War. Published later on also in 1946, the J'ai Tué, um, autobiographic um, version of Les Sanha, I Killed. So throughout all of these um, attempts and experiences, Ligé learned a lot about himself, in fact. Ended up translating uh, 24 of his uh, scenes and extracts for the Ballet Mechanical Ballet. So, what should, um, in conclusion, be uh, the balance sheet? Pessimism, irony. In fact, the results of uh, the war, obviously, and mobilization brought down a little bit of all of those negative images.